All right, let's get going. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're ready for another sunny morning of uh, chemistry, Chem 1211, with your host, me, Dr. White. Now, something that usually happens once or twice, and it finally happened this semester, uh, earlier in the week, I'd say today, I'll go through the equilibrium problem set. Well, oh no, I did that last Friday and somebody should have corrected me. Uh, I actually, a couple of years ago, gave a lecture and 10 minutes into the lecture, one of the students said, you know, you talked about that on Monday. <laughs> oh, never mind. And why didn't you tell me when I was starting? <laughs> well, review, uh, repetition is good for their grade years too. So what are we gonna do today? I thought like I did yesterday, and you can tell I got a different shirt on, so I'm just playing yesterday's video. But anyway, I should do that one day. No, I won't. That cheat you. I don't do that. But anyways, uh, I'm going to go through some of the equilibrium stuff with you, give you extra practice. Then we'll do a little pH stuff. And then we'll do today's lab. All right, let's get to work. Now, one of the important things you should know how to do is draw an energy diagram. In an energy diagram, you have an equation, and on one side or the other, you have heat. In this case, when heat is on the right, hopefully you know this is right and this is left, when you're facing the screen, uh, that is exothermic. When it's on the left, is endothermic. So let's look at number four. I have ammonia plus hydrogen, make ammonia, nitrogen plus hydrogen, making ammonia plus heat. That's an equilibrium. And on the y axis is energy, on the x axis is time. Now, in our universe, there's something called conservation of energy. We never destroy or create energy. And here, we have a certain amount of energy from the nitrogen and ammonia. On this side, ammonia, I keep on saying that, uh, nitrogen and hydrogen. On this side, we have a certain total energy of the ammonia and heat. Well, if I say nitrogen hydrogen has arbitrarily this much energy, notice the total energy here is ammonia plus heat. If I lose the heat, what you do, Ammonia is going to have less energy than this side because some of the energy total on this side is lost to heat, and therefore it's lower. Uh, how lower? If you notice, I never put scales on there. Yes, we can look up energy diagrams with numbers on them, but I don't do that in this class. Another important thing you should know is that where you start and to the top of the hill is called the activation energy. Got to got have enough energy in a collision to go over the cell and down the hill to grandmother's house we go. No, actually the ammonia. And that's the activation energy. And you should know that. Now, while we have an energy diagram up there, let me ask you a question. And as I found out yesterday and also on Wednesday, if you can't read my handwriting, remember I say all questions are good questions. A perfectly good question is, what the heck did you just write? So I'll translate if you haven't figured out my handwriting or printing, how does the catalyst work? And it's your turn. I'll let you think about it and I'll tell you. Now, it's important read a question. I am not asking you what is a catalyst? I'm asking, how does a catalyst work? While you're doing that, I'm going to have some tea. Anybody? 
anybody old enough to remember the Lipton jingle? Take TNC. Uh-oh, I just pulled a generation gap on you people. All right, I'll give you five more seconds. 4.2, point, 4.4, 4.85, 4. time's up. Uh, how does a catalyst work? It lowers the activation energy. What it does is it makes this hill lower. So it's easier to get over and the reaction goes quicker. Because what a catalyst does is speeds up the reaction rate. It does that by lowering the activation energy. Now, since I want you to have some fun too, Can everybody see at the bottom problem five? Thumbs up, people. Can you see this okay? Why don't you draw the energy diagram? And I'll write it up here again. Why don't you draw this energy diagram? And don't forget to put on the diagram the activation energy. Important announcement from Dr. White. It's still turn on your monitors week for Dr. White. So if your webcam isn't on, could you please turn it on? Pretty please? Double pretty, please. I wonder if that worked. Come on, all you people, turn on your webcam. This is the webcam shy lab. So is the other lab. And I've been reading other faculty members have a similar problem getting their I don't force you to it, but don't you want to make Dr. White happy? Or I could use Jewish guilt. You know, if you don't turn on your web camera, I'm going to be very sad. All right, anybody need more time? Thumbs up, people. Are you done? I thought about that, Kelly, but no, that's not right because some people may not have a web camera. They should, but they don't. All right, let's do this. Now, if we look at this equilibrium, the first thing, notice heat is on the left, and this is an endothermic reaction. Ooh, that would be a good test question. What type of reaction is this? XO or endo. And what that tells us is if we have an energy diagram, oh, we do. Here's the energy. Here's the time on the x axis. In case you forgot, this is y, this is x. You don't have to put that down, but I just thought I'd tell you. Now, arbitrarily, I'll put water. Say right here. Now the total energy on this side equals the total energy on this side. But if we look at water, the energy water has is the total energy minus E. But the total energy on this side equals this side. So if water is here, hydrogen and oxygen will be higher because you're adding heat this will have more energy than water alone. And you have your little hill, over the hill and down the hill, the grandmother's house we know. I can't stop doing that. I'm addicted to it. Somebody know what rhyme or song that comes from? Email me. And then from here to the top is the activation energy. Remember, for 
exothermic reactions, the product energy is lower than the reactants. For endothermic, since you're adding heat, the product energy will be higher than the reactants. Next, let's look at equilibrium constant. And I showed you the equilibrium constant is the concentration of each product. Remember, this is product side. This is reactant or reactants. And the product, each product to the power of the coefficient. Remember, the coefficient is the number that goes times the other concentration of the products. Remember, when I put something in a bracket like that, that's moles per liter, and you know that's concentration, divided by the concentrations to the power of the, of the coefficients of the reactants. So for this one, our products are sodium and oxygen. Notice the coefficient for sodium is four, so it's this to the fourth power. And when there's no number, that's one, which we don't show right here. If you did, I'd smile when I'm grading it, but I wouldn't take off points. I see weird things, I smile. Why not? Life's to be enjoyed. And then divided by the reactants. In this case, the reactant is only sodium oxide. Notice the coefficient is two, and that's that. Now, don't tell anybody I'm being nice. Common mistakes students make, instead of multiplication, and I see this over and over again, they put a plus sign there. It's wrong. It's a multiplication. I think they see the plus sign here and copy it over. No. Don't, it's multiplication. And now, let me hide this. Don't look, I see people peeking. Oh, come on. Now let's go to another one. All right, this is better. Can everybody see C at the bottom? right here, write the equilibrium constant for ferric bromide, ferrous bromide going to ferric bromide and bromine. And if you can, turn on your web cameras, even if you didn't watch behind the ears this morning. That was awful. Remind me never to use that line again. When I do the polling, does that pop up on a pop up on your screen? Thank you, thumbs up, people. When I say something to ask a question, you've been trained to put your thumb up. Pavlov would be proud of me. If you don't know that reference, Google it. Oh no, I haven't done that in years. That's a rare event you just heard. Dr. White used Google as a verb. I almost never do that. All right, looks like everybody's done. 
I better get to work. And how do you do this? You take the reactants to the power of the coefficient on top and the reactants on bottom. The first one here is the reactant. Notice the coefficient is two, so it's the second power. Bromine, when there's no coefficient, remember that's one, and it's the concentration of bromine. Remember, it's times, not plus, to the power one. You don't have to put a number there. And the reactants, there's only one, ferrous bromide, and the, here's the co to the concentration, and the coefficient is two, and that's how you do it. Now, let's talk about predict the relative amounts of reactants and products for an equilibrium. When K equilibrium is much greater than one, let me clean that up. That looks better. Then, therefore, the products, three dots in math means, therefore, products are greater than the reactants. Hold on one second, I'm running out of room. I'll put it up here. And if the K equilibrium is much less than one, the reactants are greater than the products. And if we look at the first problem, A, we have this equilibrium and the K equilibrium is 2.0 times 10 to the fourth. That's much greater than one. Therefore, the products are greater than the reactants. Can everybody see B at the bottom of your screen? It's your turn to pretend that's, I'll write it so you can see it in case you can't. There you go. <clears throat> you predict which is greater, the reactants or products. I don't work you hard this morning. Where's my whip? That's right, I gotta buy a new one. My old one died. That reminds me of my favorite first bull whip, Dr. Whiteson's Unusual Weapons. And my first bull whip I got, I think it was junior year of high school, was a 16 footer swivel base, all leather bull whip. When my timing was right, I could crack that. It would be almost as loud as a M80 firecracker. M88, I think they're called. So you better watch out for Dr. White. You didn't know I'm a chemical ninja. All right, let's do this. If we look at K equilibrium, notice it's 10 to the minus 34th, is that a tiny number? Yes, it's much less than one. And when K equilibrium is much less than one, 
Therefore, that's what the three dots mean. The reactants are greater than the product. And you can look at the other ones and do it on your own. I hope you have. Now, let's look at Le Chatelier's principle. Take a deep breath. Now, I think I did this one last week, so let's do another one. Everybody see number 11 at the base. Thumbs up, people. Thank you. Now, I'm going to write the problem up here for the following reaction. And let me give you a little more of this. What happens to CO2 and water? concentration doesn't look like magic me writing on the screen <laughs> you don't see my hand and pen or the pointer all right what happens to carbon monoxide, CO, and hydrogen if you put the reaction in an ice bath? Remember, ice bath removes heat. Boiling water adds heat. I hope you're all looking forward to the weekend. I got a lot of work to do around my house. Changed my sump pump uh, outside hose from the winter to the spring, summer, smaller one. Mow the lawn. First of all, change the oil on my uh, lawn mower and sharpen up my lawn mower blades and mow the lawn and grade labs. <laughs> all right, let's take a look at this. Everybody done? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. All right. Ice bath removes heat at equilibrium. Ooh, the plus sign got stolen. It must be the dreaded plus sign virus hit my computer. But anyways, if we look at this at equilibrium, there was a certain amount of heat, water, carbon monoxide, CO2 and hydrogen. I've removed heat. And the equilibrium says, oh, no, we don't have enough heat. Oh, no. I've got to make more heat to replace what someone removed from us. How do we do that? You go in that direction. CO2 and hydrogen react to make more heat. When something reacts, it's consumed. Remember my French silk pie? If you consume something, do you have more or less of it? And the answer is, since it's reacting to make more heat, it's going to be consumed and it will decrease. Now, if you're making more heat, we're also going to make more water and carbon monoxide. If you make more of something, what happens to the amount you have, the concentration, it will increase. And that's how you do it. And you should practice. Well, let's take a look. Why don't you try this one? What will happen to the concentration of CO and H2 if you put this in boiling water? And boiling water, psst, don't tell anybody, boiling water adds heat.
And for those of you who are wondering to see if I'm shipping you from what I did yesterday, you can always look at both videos for both labs and compare. Actually, I try very hard to do everything the same. I'll close my eyes so I can, this is a secret poll. <laughs> I don't know whose poll you're polling. Can you see, are you done in green in progress on my screen that you see? And you can see the numbers. I think everybody's done. So let's get to it. If you put it in boiling water, boiling water adds Helps if I have a pen. As heat. At equilibrium, there is a certain amount of heat. And now the equilibrium says, oh, no, I've got too much heat. I've got to get rid of this excess heat. How does it do that? It reacts. When something reacts, it's consumed. You have less. So CO reacts with water, reacts with heat to make more CO2 and hydrogen. It goes this way. Well, if something is consumed because it reacts, just like the French pie, it decreases. You have less. Now, if you are getting rid of the heat by reacting with water and CO, you're making more CO2 and hydrogen because it's going this way. And therefore, if you make more of something, the amount you have will increase. And that's how you do that. Oh, somebody pointed out the other day, uh, sometimes I move quickly on to the next slide or whatever. And as I always say, there's no such thing as a dumb question. And a good question is, can you go back to the previous slide? And the answer will always be yes. All right. Any more, any questions on equilibrium? And I'll use my North Side Chicago French accent with Chandler's principle. By the way, I'm butchering that person's. Uh, in what way, Kelly, with the heat and equilibrium? All right, by special request. Oh no, that was the last problem. Good news, Dr. White knows how to create his own. Aren't you glad you got a chemist who knows what he's doing sometimes? All right, it's two for, it's not Tuesday, two for Friday. It doesn't rhyme, but it is. Two for the price of one. What am I charging for one? Anyway, this is half price. And what happens to the concentration of A and D? I assume you all see my whiteboard. There's nobody screaming at me. Uh, if A, I put the reaction in boiling water. 
B, I put the reaction in an ice bath. Thank you for your request, Kelly. I'm sure your other colleagues will thank you too. You should. while you're doing that last night i had some fun i haven't done in a long time on youtube i think everything's on youtube except my phd graduation college graduation maybe my high school's in there but dr white loves trains i'm a train enthusiast and i got to go on there and i found some i didn't realize having worked in the netherlands and taken the trains there i found some nice youtubes of the trains in the netherlands If you've never been to Europe, their train system is so superior to what we have here. Well, maybe after President Biden gets his infrastructure plan going, I don't know if he had anything with trains there. I know they had roads. That would be nice to improve the train system in the United States. I remember uh, numerous times for one company, I used to go to Europe and work in, how many of you have heard of the cheese G-O-U-D-A? And Americans pronounce it Gouda in Dutch, and it's named after the city in Dutch, which I worked in, in the Netherlands, it's pronounced Gouda. And I would, Gouda is a very nice picture, town and every morning I was there one time I was there for four weeks I would say I had my hotel was in The Hague which is really pronounced Den Haag and it was about a 25 minute train ride through the farm fields and sometime during if I hit it in the spring there were all tulips in the middle of a tulip field you'd see a windmill with its sails out and every morning I'd take the train from Den Haag to Gouda, and I have a 10 minute walk to where I work from the train station. And I go right through the town city, uh, city center, town square. In the town square, they had the cheese house, Gouda is known for its cheese, and the uh, town hall. And both were quite old before Columbus set sail. Very beautiful way to start your morning, except when it was raining. All right. Everybody done? Let's do this. All right, what does boiling water do? It adds heat. So at equilibrium, there was a certain amount of heat, now there's too much. And the equilibrium says, oh no, I've got too much heat. How do I get rid of the excess heat? <laughs> Try and write a, draw a straight arrow first. I have to practice my arrow drawing this weekend. That's better. It reacts, heat reacts with C and D. And when heat reacts, it's consumed and you'll use up some of the excess heat. And when something is consumed, D, you will have less. The amount decreases. And since C, D, and heat are reacting to make more A and B, you make more of something, which we are, to get rid of the excess heat, the amount you have will increase. Next, ice bath removes heat. And at equilibrium, there was a certain amount of heat with the ice bath, we've removed that. And the equilibrium says, Oh, no, we don't have enough heat, we need more heat. 
Well, how can we get more heat? Only one way. A and B react to make more heat. Go this way. And when you react something, A, it's consumed, just like the French. I bet all of you will remember French salt pie from my class. But anyways, when you consume something, you have less. The amount decreases. By the way, you can use a synonym, get slower, smaller, whatever. And then if we're reacting A and B to make more heat, we're going to make more C and D. If we make more of something, in this case D, the amount you have will increase. And that's how you do it. Oh, I better get cracking so I can get you out before midnight. Any other questions? Going once, twice. All right, let's move on to pH. I think this would be a good time, even though on Monday I'll be going through the pH practice problem set. Let's do some pH. Member, acid, proton. Donor. Remember, proton is H plus. Base. Is a proton acceptor. And you should know this. Hint, hint, wink, wink, say no more. Oh, I just did a Monty Python on you guys. You've never seen episodes of Monty Python, Flying Circus. You're missing some of the best things in life. All right, now. Since water is in equilibrium with the hydronium ion, this I'll never ask on a test. and this equilibrium is mainly to the left, since water would have throw off any equilibrium constant, they came up with KW, named after me, I wish, but that's the ionization constant of water. This will be given to you in important information. At room temperature, the hydronium ion concentration times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Next, I taught you about pH, which is a measure of the hydronium ion concentration. And it's minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And the pH scale if there's one thing you should remember from my class, this is it. Hopefully you'll remember a lot more, but pH scale goes from seven to 14. At seven, it's neutral. The hydroxide ion concentration equals the hydronium. Below seven, it's acidic. That means the hydronium is greater than the hydroxide. Above seven, it's basic. And the more base you add, the closer to 14 something goes. The more acid you add, the closer to zero it goes.
and I'll do this one. And the question is, if the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2, then what is the pH of the solution? And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? I'll do this one, then you know I'm going to share. And remember, pH is minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And for this one, we can put it right in. Now, when this number is 1 or 1.0, then if the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, then where this is x, then the pH is x. So in this case, x is 2, so that the pH is 2. And if we come up here, everybody see if it's less than 7, it's acidic. Oh, did I, I think I told you, uh, one of the great miracles of life in my mind is I have and you have cells in your stomach and your body that make hydrochloric acid, HCl. And that's why the pH of your stomach is way less than uh, the stomach liquids, is way less than seven because there's acid present. Bet you didn't think about that. You're walking around with all these chemicals inside of you. All right. And also, is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Your turn. And the votes are coming in. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. And the question is, what's the pH of the solution? And I didn't do it above, I should have. We're trying to find the pH. We're given this. And in important information, test number four, you will see this. pH is minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. For this problem, here's that number. As I talked to you, this is 1.0 and it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, then this is x, in this case, 10. Is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Notice 10 is greater than 7. 
So this is basic. Forgot some of the problem. <laughs> oh, oops. All right, let me decode this for you. Ah, get back. What happens to the numerical value? And this is important. I'm asking what happens to the numerical value, of the pH of a beaker of water, at pH 7.0, if I add a five drops of H2SO4, and B, if I add five drops of KOH. Your turn. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. And for those who want to get creative, you can always do thumb puppets. You people out your cameras on. If you're done, give me a symboli thumbs up. Remember, I renamed emojis symbolies. Chemists can do that. All right, let's do it. What happens to the pH if I add five drops of H2SO4? You should know that's an acid. And pH 14, 7, 0. When you add an acid, it makes it more acidic but I'm asking the numerical value and it will decrease or go down. What is KOH? KOH is a base. When you add a base, you make it more basic, but I'm asking about the numerical value and the pH will increase. And you should know about this. And with that, oh, good timing on my part. It's time to take a five minute break. I'll see you at 9.55. That's when the big hand is on the 11. Or if you have a digital watch, Sven Gulli, I haven't heard that name in a long time. Ask me about shock theater. Break time. See you at 9.55.
oh, no, I'm late. There was a traffic jam in my hallway. If you buy that, I can sell you a bridge from downtown Chicago. <laughs> Time to get going. Come back, come back wherever you are. <laughs> All right, let's continue on with assets and bases. And let me give you one more for you to try. Let's get a fresh screen here. And well, let me read it. If the hydroxide ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus fourth, then what is the pH of that solution? And important information, you will have the following. Students used to have to memorize this in my class. But good news, you don't. There are some still things you do. And it's your turn. Oh, it makes my heart feel good to see everybody working on their pH problems or pretending to see everybody's doing it with your monitors off or webcam off. And for those of you who care, I noticed in the local flyer for place I do my food shopping, Valley Produce, Vidalia onions are back in season and available. And if you're an onion freak like I am, mm, good news. If you've never had a Vidalia onion, go out and buy one, try it. They're good. They're very mild and super sweet. and one of your colleagues doesn't like onions, get out of my class. You're un-American. I bet you don't like Chevrolet or apple pie either. I'm just kidding. All right, let's do this. I want to get you out before midnight. All right, what are we trying to find? pH. What are we given?
the hydroxide ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus fourth. And now we're also in important information. You're given this, but wait, pH, I need this and I don't have it. So what do you have to do? You need two steps. Step one. Solve for hydronium ion concentration. Why? Because then I can use this formula to calculate the pH. So how do we do that? Well, you use this. Hydronium ion concentration times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And now we want to solve for hydronium, H3O plus, so I have to get rid of hydroxide. Remember, anything divides by itself equals one. Anybody having nightmares hearing me say that? Hope not. And cancels out. So if I want to get rid of the hydroxide on this side, I'll divide by it. But whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And anything divided by itself cancels out and we're left with the hydronium equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th divided by the hydroxide. And if I scroll up, I can see, oh look, the hydroxide is 1.0 times 10 to the minus fourth. So I can put that in there. And this is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 10th. Am I done? No, I'm trying to find the pH. So we need the second step. Determine the pH and pH which you're given in important information, like I had right up here, pH is minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And for this, we just calculated the pH or the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 10. <clears throat> and remember when minus log, when the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, the pH is X, In this case X is 10. So that's my answer. By the way, that's basic. I didn't ask you that, but it is. And that's how you do it. And on Monday, we'll be going through more. Ooh, public service announcements from Dr. White. Da -da 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 -da. Breaking news. <laughs> I got to get a sign I can hold up. Breaking news. Nah. Anyways, don't forget, Monday, I will be going through the uh, chapter, what is that, 14 pH acid problem set, but make sure you try it. Also, don't forget that the deadline for past labs is this Saturday, 10 a.m. And the lab that's due today, you have until Sunday, 1 p.m. to get it in. No late labs after that, you get a zero if you don't get it in on time. Should really be due today. You had a whole week to do it. And don't forget, get it in. And the extra credit project is due, not due, but the deadline is next Thursday, I think sometime Thursday afternoon. And if you have any questions about if you did it right, either come to my office hour Monday or 
Well, Wednesday is too late. Well, not really. Or email to me and I'll check it. And remember, read what you can use, what you can't. And the most important thing, ingredient has to be on an ingredient label. You can't say, oh, air has oxygen in it. Well, if you look at the oxygen around air around me, there's no ingredient label, so you can't use it. Oh, by the way, one time a student uh, put down scuba tank, air, oxygen. I said, you show me a picture of the ingredient label on that tank, I'll give you credit. And didn't have that on there, just said air. So I said, you got to have an ingredients label on whatever you use. All right, it's lab time. And today's lab, you're going to be using Beyond Lab Z. I hope you've enjoyed using that. Last summer, we used another product that was, it was worse than that. It stunk. It didn't work. I had trouble making it work. If I had trouble making it work, you know it was awful. But Beyond Lab Z is much better. All right. Today's lab deals with titration. Titration, let me open it up. Everybody see titration of unknown? Thank you, thumbs up, people. All right. Today's lab deals with titration of an unknown molarity HCl solution. Hydrochloric acid, HCl, <clears throat> excuse me, is an acid. Now, titration is when you add a known amount of an acid or base of a known molarity to a known amount of an acid or base of an unknown molarity. And at neutralization, the indicator, a pH indicator, changes color. And the following is true. Moles of acid equals moles of base. Now, moles of acid, as you learn from solution chemistry, is milliliters times the molarity. <clears throat> and when it's monoprotic, you can take out the thousand because it's on both sides. And milliliters times molarity acid equals milliliters of base times molarity of base. In this lab, you'll be determining the molarity of HCl solution, HCl hydrochloric acid. If you're trying to determine the molarity of HCl using this equation number two, you have values for most of the, the other values in number two, and you have to solve for molarity. Capital M, remember that's molarity, HCl. Well, here's the equation number two. I want to solve for molarity. Therefore, to get rid of milliliters of HCl, I subtract, I um, subtract, divide HCl on this side. Hold on. <clears throat> oh, my throat's got a little whatever. Hold on, I got to test it. Moles, moles, it works now. All right, now divide this side by milliliters of HCl because I'm solving for molarity, capital M HCl. You got to do it to the other side. This cancels out. And this is equation three. In this lab, you will be using titration technique to determine molarity of HCl. Now I have the procedure. Let's actually go through it. All right. <clears throat> oh, I think I better take tomorrow off. Boy, I can. Open the chemistry. All right, everybody see titrations on the screen? Now do you see titrations on the screen? Hold on. Now do you see it? Thank you. All right, don't click here. Everybody see where it says worksheet? Lower left. See where it says acid-based chemistry? Click on that. 
Now, if you scroll down using this bar on the side, does everybody see under worksheets now, acid-base titration of unknown HCL? Does everybody feel confident you can get to that place? I'll go through it again. Under worksheets, you click on acid-base chemistry. You scroll down to acid-base titration unknown HCL. Click on that. Everybody see the lab now? All right, let's go through what's here. This glass tube right here with this little arm is called a burette. And a burette is a way of adding a certain amount, a measured amount that you can measure of liquid. Now, the little orange bars here, this is called a stopcock. And it's a valve. And when you open it, you add liquid. And when you close it, you stop. Now, in here, they've already put your sodium, uh, HCL. Notice over here, we have HCL solution. Everybody see that in the lower left? And on there, it's unknown number 12. And yours might open up to a different one. They do that in here. Now, inside here, we have the HCL solution. And if you look at the PDF file for this lab, 121, you don't have to because I helped you out. Shh, don't tell anybody and be nice. In the beaker, there's 25.00 milliliters of that HCL solution. And I've already recorded that in table one. And we'll go through the stuff in a little while. Now, what I would recommend is you practice moving this, see how I'm doing drop-wise, even less slower drop-wise, then it's faster, slower. When it's open like that, I don't know where the name came from, but we call that shotgunning it. And you can go slower, fast. If you look over here, does everybody see in the upper left-hand corner the magnification of the burette? The burette is like a very accurate graduated cylinder that you can have small amounts. Now, if we look at the burette, let me do this. Start over again. All right, when you're actually doing the lab, this is where the burette is starting. Can you see that? And notice the liquid in there, the sodium hydroxide. When you're in a burette, water or a solution, an aqueous solution, you know aqueous means water solvent, it's not a straight line in CU. And this is called the meniscus. And the volume is at the bottom of the U. Notice it's right at zero. So this would be starting initial reading 0, 0.00. Sometimes they have a little more than this where it's like uh, 0 0.05 or whatever. Notice the lines between zero and one. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and it's a big one, 10. So each one of these lines is a 10th of a milliliter. And if the meniscus bottom is between this line, the first little line, you could call that 0 0.05. So you can get here out two significant figures past the decimal on any burette. Now, in here you have over here, can everybody see my little hand now on the screen? Okay. Now you see it as a pointer. Okay. In there, they have what's called a pH indicator. And a pH indicator changes color when the acid and base, in this case, when the base is one molecule over 
neutralization. And in this case, we're using bromo cresol blue, which goes from yellow to blue. Most labs use phenothalian, which goes from clear to a wine color red. But in this lab, they also have a pH meter, which you can look at, but I would use the indicator. Now, in this lab, what you'll do is slowly add the base to the beaker of acid until the color changes. You record the initial volume and the final volume. When the color changes, that's called the endpoint. When the color changes, that's the endpoint. If you do it one drop over the endpoint when you get it and you don't go way past it where you're going to get bad results, at the endpoint, moles of acid equals moles of base. And you can use the calculation equations I showed you. Now, Dr. White's done so many of these in my life that if I had a dollar for everyone, I'd go to Europe and have a good time right now. Not that I want to with the pandemic, but I could, or I could go anywhere in the world. I've done, well, th probably thousands of these in my life. Yeah. But anyways, here's a secret. The first time you do this, and if you're in a lab and you don't know what it should be, you shotgun it in. Watch what I'm going to do. See how it's going super fast? I'm keeping an eye on this right here. I'm not looking over here. And this one, you don't count as a run. Nope. You see the pH is slowly starting to come up, but I go, you should go by the color. See how I'm adding a lot at a time? I can slow it down. This also gives you a chance to practice. Oh, it changed color. You see how good Dr. White is? He got it to one. Am I a pro or am I a pro? Now notice it's about 16.25. Now, I would not record this. Hold on. Actually, I read it wrong. 16.1, 0 0.2, 16.35. So 16.35 milliliters. Don't record this. This is your shotgun one. And that was practice. Now, exit. Open it up again. And now you have the same setup. And we're at zero. And you know you can shotgun it to about 50 and a half and then go slow from 50 and a half till it changes color. And that way you can do titrations quicker and more accurately. Everybody get that down. And don't tell anybody I'm giving away these top secret stuff. Shh. But anyways, that's what you're going to do. You're going to do it twice. Whenever you do a titration in a lab, you always do it in duplicate to make sure your first run was accurate because it should be the same as your second run. And that's today's lab. Now, if you look at the procedure, I have listed what you just did. The only thing I don't have in there is the top secret, how to get the um, crude amount fast. And what you're going to do is two runs. Put down your unknown HCL, read the bottle of the NaOH to get the molarity. See, oh, someone was nice enough to see simulation NaOH bottle. Also, you can look in the PDF too. And what's the initial one? Zero or whatever you read. What's the final one? That's when the color changes. And the difference of these two, I didn't put an equation because I figured you could figure out final minus initial is the amount of NaOH you put in there, which then you have to calculate the molarity. And how do you calculate the molarity? Well, you'll have the milliliters 
of NaOH you use that's final minus initial times the molarity of the NaOH divided by 25.00 because that's what they set the slab up and you'll get the molarity. And guess what? Oh no, Dr. White threw in some questions. Yes, they are. And I didn't put a mile of them or a thousand of them, but there's some good ones. And with that, I'm done. And I can wish you a great weekend. And I can say, gang is on. Goodbye. Have a great weekend. Stay healthy. Oh, one thing. I think I mentioned Wednesday, but I'll mention it again. This is very important. If you haven't, thank you, Erica. If you haven't gotten your set up for your vaccination for COVID-19, get it. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned Wednesday. I th think I did, but I'll mention it again. Uh, throughout my life, when I get certain shots, uh, I don't react well to them. Years ago, when I got a tetanus shot, for two days, my whole left arm was paralyzed. I couldn't use it. And, and it, was, uh, it wasn't fun. Worse, when I was an infant, my parents told me, for those of you, uh, good Kelly, uh, for those of you who probably don't remember, I don't think they do it anymore, but to get rid of smallpox, we got smallpox vaccination, which I think they gave what was it, the cowpox uh, antibodies or whatever. And I got so sick, it almost killed me when I was an infant. In fact, my parents told me the story that my temperature was so high, at times they packed me in ice. And for a while, my back was paralyzed. I couldn't sit up or anything as an infant. And good news, I survived in case you were wondering. But I went and got the Pfizer. No problem, first time, second time. Just a little sensitivity right here, no problem. I said, thank you. <laughs> also the people, woman who gave me the shot each time, thank you, she did a great job. Different women and they were where I got it through my uh, health provider, NCH, get your shots. If you've been following the news, most of the people are getting very sick now in hospitals are your age. My age, 75% of us have had both our shots. I have, but I'm still going to wear a mask, not only to protect other people, but to protect me. And with that important information, I can now say, have a great weekend. Gang gesund. Goodbye.